Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Grant Thornton uh, webinar on the new era of governance and the need uh, for a continuous evaluation of your governance uh, process and procedures. Today, I am joined by a fantastic panel um, and you'll see for yourself. So let me take this opportunity and I'll introduce you to my panel. Uh, we have Mr. Bharat Vasani, Senior Advisor, Cyril Amachan Mangaldas. Mr. Vasani is a seasoned legal professional who is uh, currently a Senior Advisor, Corporate Law at Mumbai office of Cyril Amachan Mangaldas. He's, he was a corporate partner in CAMP for the last five years and has extensively advised on complex issues of corporate and securities law. Prior to joining CAM, uh, Mr. Vasani was a legal advisor to, to Tata Group chairman, having also in his earlier role been the chief legal and group counsel of the Tata Group. His areas of specialization include corporate and commercial laws, M&A, joint ventures, and securities law. To put it very simply, who doesn't know Mr. Vasani? But it's always nice to kind of, you know, it's, it's always, a, it's, it's with immense pleasure uh, that I invite you, Mr. Vasani, to join this panel. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Mr. Vasani is also a very keen public speaker and was selected to speak on India's Competition Act at the reputed Chatham House, London. He is a prolific writer and routinely shares his views on various contemporary aspects related to corporate governance and other corporate law issues on a different public forum. He was earlier a specialist editor of the 19th edition of Aramaya's celebrated commentary on Companies Act. And you may be interested to note that in the last three years, Mr. Vasani has authored more than 50 blogs on diverse array of topics ranging from company law, SEBI regulations, FEMA, and corporate governance. Welcome, Mr. Vasani. I now uh, take immense pride in also introducing Ms. Savitri Parikh. Ms. Savitri Parikh has over 30 years of corporate experience and is currently the company secretary and compliance officer of Reliance Industries Limited. She has worked in a variety of sectors, including manufacturing, outsourcing services, private equity, media, pharmaceuticals, textile, and chemicals. She is a specialist editor of A. Ramaya Guide to Companies Act 2015 edition, also being a general editor of MC Bhandari Guide to Company Law Procedures, Handbook on Listing Obligations and Disclosure Requirements, jointly authored with Ms. Shailashree Bhaskar. She's also a guest faculty at IIM Calcutta for over the past 10 years and a regular speaker or programs organized by ICSI, ICAI, Chambers of Commerce, Ministry of Corporate Affairs and Stock Exchanges. She's a chairperson of the Governance Committee of the Bobby Chamber of Commerce and Industry. She's also been a member of the working group constituted by SEBI on trading plans. Welcome, Savitri. It's a pleasure to have you on the panel with us. I now take... Uh, you know, immense, again, a very warm welcome to Elizabeth Hughes. Elizabeth is the partner who leads our London Transpricing practice, who has been with Grant Thornton for 18 years. She has specialized in transpricing and international tax for nearly 30 years and has worked both in the UK and Europe. She's here today to bring a UK transpricing perspective to our discussions. Welcome, Elizabeth. And it's again a pleasure to have you on our panel this afternoon. Priya is an economist from London School of Economics and University of Wales. Her core area of expertise is transpricing for the last 15 years. She's also a related party transaction governance expert. And today she will share her views on the interplay of arm's length principle and governance. Welcome, Priya. Pleasure Thank you. to have you on the panel. Uh, I now would love to introduce uh, Prasenjit. Prasenjit is a governance professional and a fellow company secretary and lawyer with more than 16 years of experience. His compliance and consulting experiences stand majorly in company law, FEMA and capital markets law. He's a regular speaker and trainer at professional and academic forums and business associations for various technical and management topics, as well as penned numerous articles and research papers. Welcome Prasenjit, pleasure to have you on the panel with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We yeah, thank you. Uh, with that, and you, as you can see, you know, a panel full of experts bringing in industry, legal, uh, legal uh, inputs, and legal secretarial economists, and of course, cross-border uh, inputs. We now will look at 
why did we pick this topic and what is it that we're really going to be talking about? So I would actually, you know, say that if we've seen the LODR regulations have not, I mean, they were pretty much steady, stable, no major changes. However, over the past few years, one has seen that SEBI has introduced quite a few changes. SEBI being our capital market regulator, especially for listed companies in India, has introduced various amendments and introduced changes to our LODR regulations. So what does it mean from a business standpoint? So Savitri, I will first, uh, the question will move to you. What's your take on the adaptation of the regulatory amendments introduced by SEBI uh, over the last few years? What's your take on that? Sure. Ratri, at the outset, I would compliment you for an excellent topic which has been chosen for this discussion today. Related party transactions, while it's not new to the Indian corporates, right from 2014, April onwards, we've been working uh, with, with various legislations like Companies Act and LODR from 2015 onwards. But even today, this is one provision which evokes maximum doubts, questions, which we would also see in the chatbot in a short in, in the chat box in a short while from now, possibly in the question and answer um, column of the uh, of the session. Uh, coming to your question, Rajshri, um, with respect to related party transactions, as you rightly said, there have been several changes which have been introduced even in the recent past. Few changes uh, have been made from first of April, two thousand twenty-three with respect to the definition of related party, or for that matter, even with respect to transactions where the company is not a party to the transaction. Let me just elaborate a little bit on this. Um, typically, when you look at related party transactions, you would approach the term related party from the perspective of provisions of Companies Act or from INDAIS. Now, INDAIS being the accounting standard applicable to most of the companies in India today, uh, INDAIS actually proceeds on the principles of disclosure, while under LODR, there's a prior approval for a related party transaction that is required. Now, where the company, where the listed entity is a party to a related party transaction, taking approval as well as identifying it becomes fairly easy because it is business as usual. However, under LODR, it is not just transactions where the listed entity is a party, but also transactions to which the subsidiaries of the listed entity are parties, is a party or are parties. So say for example, if A Limited is a listed entity, A Limited may not be a party to a transaction, but probably AB Limited, which is a subsidiary of A Limited, is a party to a transaction which is a related party transaction. And if the transaction of this AB limited exceeds the threshold, which today is 10% of the standalone turnover of AB limited, that is the subsidiary, then it will require approval of the, uh, of the listed entity. This is one major uh, amendment. And this 10% threshold, of course, this amendment came into effect from 1st of April, 2022, but the threshold has got reduced to 10% of the standalone turnover of the subsidiary concern, effective 1st of April 2023. Second is the um, purpose and effect test, which has also come into effect from 1st of April 2023, where the transaction may be with a third party completely. However, if the purpose and effect of the transaction is to benefit a related party, of the listed entity or its subsidiary, then once again, the provisions of related party transactions of LODR will come into play. Now, under LODR, you require prior approval of the uh, audit committee. And in case it is a transaction which exceeds the thresholds of 10% of the annual consolidated turnover of the listed entity or 1,000 crores, you would then require approval of the shareholders of the listed entity. In a nutshell, this is what I would say is the material provision with respect to related party transactions. Sure. Thanks for that, Savitri. And rightly said, in fact, uh, you know, especially around where we have to go down the approval road, I think that's the tough one. 
because even if you were to look at the current provisions today, let's assume if there is a transaction where I would have to go to the shareholder. Then it's a question of, you know, majority amongst the minority. And yeah. in today's day and age, especially where a uh, minority shareholders typically are considered to be remote, uh, remotely connected with business, but you still have a say, you're still giving them the right to actually determine some of the critical transactions which are imperative for running off, you know, uh, the operations. So just very quickly, this is the RPT approval process, which we thought we could just uh, kind of display so that people, you know, do have a sense of when do you really need to go to a shareholder. But pretty much as is evident, uh, the audit committee does have, uh, you know, the approval power. And it's only if it is not in the ordinary course, that's when they go to the board and, of course, shareholders. So it's listed out in this slide, I thought, for ease of convenience. Since you referred to the purpose and sorry, Santri, you want to say something? No, 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 I'm fine. This is a very nice slide. It, it okay. gives you the provisions at a glance. That's right. So, uh, Kirul, since you touched upon the purpose and effect, I will now move on to the next question to Mr. Vasani. Uh, Mr. Vasani, what are the bright line tests which the uh, audit committee should probably use to identify potential transactions for scrutiny? Uh, to ensure that this purpose and effect test as prescribed under LODR for listed companies with non-related uh, uh, parties. So just your take on that. Yeah, Rajasri, thank you very much. And thank you, Savitri, for providing a general input so that I can now straight move to technicalities. See, the uh, this provision, which seems to have been uh, taken from the UK premium listing rules, that purpose and effect test, which is kind of a anti-abuse provision, uh, which came into force on 1st April 23, has kind of created a lot of challenges for the audit committee and the compliance officers. For the simple reason that, you know, when you have a counterparty which is defined, which is a related party, you can examine. But with the counterparty can be anybody, any person or an entity. It means virtually every transaction entered into by a company in a financial year. So you are looking at the entire universe of transactions without any materiality threshold. And if the purpose and effect of the transaction is to benefit a listed entity or any of its subsidiary, then you are supposed to take the approval. Now, uh, two, three issues are there. First of all, I think uh, this is one provision where corporate India was most uncomfortable. Uh, now, I understand that uh, most of the companies have started taking the calls on what are the transactions they would need to. And by and large, I don't think many transactions in this category have been identified. Now, why, first of all, it came in this is exactly like the R provision section 95 to 102 of the Income Tax Act. Uh, it is an anti-abuse provision. It says that uh, basically they want to catch on every transaction because of a couple of corporate scandals which happened when this Delhi working group was preparing its report. Where they found that corporate structures are being devised and transactions are structured in a manner that you artificially introduce an unrelated party in between. And so that the transaction escapes the regulatory scrutiny. But effectively, the ultimate beneficiary of the transaction is a related party. Now, there are no statutorily defined bright line tests. They neither SEBI nor Ministry, Ministry of Corporate Affairs is not concerned because this provision is applicable only to listed companies. But SEBI has not provided any FAQ guidance note, informal guidance on this. So one would have to go by what is generally being used as a bright line test for this kind of transaction. Uh, the board of directors need to be vigilant, particularly the audit committee, because the audit responsibility has been cast on the audit committee to look at these transactions. So should they go solely and rely on the certification by CEO and CFO and the compliance officer that there are no such transactions and they take their certification at face value, or they need to ask probably questions. Now, I have found three types of audit committee registry in practice. One is the committee which says, how do we look at so many transactions? So we'll take the management's word at face value. So they just don't do any further probing. The second audit committee is a deeply suspicious type of audit committee, which would like to challenge every assumption of the management and would like to go into it as if they are the forensic auditors. And the third is a balanced approach where they would ask the right questions before confirming that there are no such transactions. So what are the bright line tests? Is it a circular transaction? Is it a transaction which has unnecessary legs which are not required to complete the transaction? Is it a transaction with an accommodating party? There are many, many such tests which one can look at. Is it a transaction 
with irrelevant legs in non standard commercial terms you know by and large in the industry there are standard commercial terms for every type of transaction there are some very unusual terms which you find and the cardinal rule which every audit committee should apply which i will say is the right line test is that is the transaction disproportionately benefiting a one particular party see collective bargaining agreements these days every group does the collective bargaining for the entire group whether it's purchase of stationery uniform anything that are they are not bad because everybody is equally benefited but if a transaction is structured in a manner that there is a third non related third party is introduced in between and we know the case of an airline which is now under a scanner where this kind of transactions were introduced the issue is that you are disproportionately benefiting a promoter entity at the cost of other other minority shareholders so the board of directors of an audit committee in this case has to be extremely particular to see that they don't lend up ignoring this kind of transactions uh my discussions with various audit committee members suggest that they are finding it very difficult to actually implement it because see if it's a the counter parties are related parties to the sap system and the accounting system that track it but here there is no counter party which is defined so essentially most of the audit committees as of today as we speak are going by the confirmations from the management that there are no such transactions very few audit committees are asking the questions which i just referred to to ensure that there are no such irrelevant legs circular transactions transactions without any economic substance which in transactions which disproportionately benefit one particular entity thank you that was yeah absolutely uh, i mean clearly it is a very tough task for the audit committee i mean as one can see um while we look at how audit committees you know a what is their uh, terms of reference and essentially the test that needs to be applied while looking at especially the related party transaction and the requirement Uh, set out by the regulator, uh, the Indian regulator. I will would like to bring in Liz out here and get uh, Liz uh, Elizabeth. Liz, for you, how does the UK capital market regulator, basically the FCA and PRA, monitor and regulate governance around RPTs and the interest of the minority shareholders? Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, the, the UK regulators. Uh, example the financial conduct authority the fca and the credential regulation authority known as pra which is part of the bank of england they they're long established and embedded in the financial life of the uk large or, or kind of regulated businesses so for example the pra regulates 1500 banks building societies insurers and investment companies but turning to your question um so those regulators set rules and there are rules in the UK for listed businesses around the disclosure of transactions with related parties and in some cases those transactions need independent shareholder approval and or to produce a kind of shareholder what's known as a shareholder circular in relation to those transactions now word of uh, what it those rules don't apply to every related party transaction so for example there's a materiality um test based on by percent by reference to certain tests and those tests are around gross assets or profits or consideration or gross capital but i have got a word of warning for everyone which is that the fca is currently um consulting about updating these rules and similar ones to make them less onerous and to maintain london as a you know kind of prime place to do business um and so under the proposals the fca thinks that related party transactions that meet those threshold like more than 5% of the tests i mentioned a minute ago and where they're not in the ordinary course of business they require issuers to exclude the director from the board discussions and the decision and make a timely announcement about um the related party transaction as soon as the terms are agreed and importantly they have to include in that announcement that the related party transaction is fair and reasonable uh, as far as its security holders are concerned and the um that the the issuer has obtained written confirmation from the sponsor to to that effect now what i think is really interesting is that the word fair and reasonable 
um, is not the same test that the UK authorities apply to related party transactions where we say they have to be on an arm's length basis. And those things sound very similar, but they're not exactly the same tests. So, for example, the, the definition of what could be a related party under the tax rules can sometimes include third parties. Um, and you do sometimes see the tension between these two sets of rules. So, for example, I have a business that is um, a captive insurer in the Channel Islands and the regulator says, I want you to have more capital in that business to, to address volatility in the market. But the UK tax authorities have said, I, I don't like you having that much capital there because it means that you get more return uh, and that reduces UK taxes paid. So this is a story that's evolving and it's a story of potential Patience, fair to say. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that perspective. Interestingly, uh, when we look at rigors, uh, even if it is related party, because today I think business as usual and materially new transactions, uh, you know, probably one could draw a, a difference out, bring out a difference out there. But the question really is, even if it's with a related party, is your transaction arm's length? And if it is arm's length, you know, here I will now uh, direct my next question to Priya. Priya, you know, we've seen that the audit committee is the approving authority, or at least they need to approve. And that took prior approval, essentially, uh, for all related party transactions, where you sit and look at, you know, distinguish between if are these business in the ordinary course of business, or are these, you know, different, but any which way, there is a process that's already in place. And the objective clearly was that this is for more transparency, more disclosure, and also information being made available to a larger audience of shareholders and not just to a selected few. Yeah. Keeping that in mind, uh, you know, one would look at is the audit company actually justified in using the ALP arrived at using the transpricing methods prescribed under 92C of the Income Tax Act in the absence of any legislative guidance from either the MCA or SEBI. Uh, so it'll be interesting to get your perspective on that. Sure, Ajri, thanks for the question. I think it's very relevant and very practical to understand and you know to know what arm's length is. Okay? So, um, as you rightly mentioned, there is nothing defined in the Companies Act or the SEBI LODR. So, typically from a local reference point, I think Income Tax Act comes in very handy, wherein there are a set of methods that are prescribed, there's interpersonal range that's prescribed. But what uh, one needs to really understand is the intent of the IT Act and rules is to govern that the Indian taxpayer uh, and the taxable income that it discloses is there is no leakage to that. There is no shifting away to that, right? But when we talk from a perspective of a Companies Act or a SEBI LODR, there the intent is towards governance, and it's not just towards one particular entity. So uh, typically, what we have seen is that independent directors or board members are also keen to know that what is the international best practice around it. And many times we are asked as to, you know, what will be the interquartile range for this particular transaction? Or is there an alternate way to kind of determine arm's length other than only testing the profitability? So um, when we talk about or when we recommend as professionals as to what's best practice one needs to follow, uh, really we need to understand what the intent is. And as also Liz mentioned, the coverage of transaction uh, under the IT Act is anyways disclosed in the TP form and documentation. And that has to be determined at arm's length under the four corners of the IT Act. But for other transaction, other domestic transaction that may not be covered for transfer pricing purpose, but yet they are to be approved by the board and the shareholders, one can have a larger perspective and a broader view and also see what's there, uh, you know, the international best practice recommend there. And eventually, I think arm's length is not just about the computation of the profit margin or the price. It's also about the, you know, as the need and benefit of the transaction, what are the drivers of the transaction. So a lot of aspect goes into making that decision whether this RPT is to be approved or not. 
Sure. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, you know, again, when we talk about related party transactions, we talk, we spoke about arms price. The question, and of course, there have been no specific guidance or rule either, you know, prescribed by SEBI or uh, by MCA in terms of what is arms length. And so the tendency is always to then go for fall back on what the income tax prescribes, basically, you know, the range or uh, I think moving on, and maybe I'll come back to this point later, the fact that timing, right? A, A we're talking about a prior approval. We then essentially talk about businesses actually carrying on those transactions. We then talk about filing of tax returns in India. And then at that point in time, you're again testing those transactions. And then you have an audit that happens later, right? So question really is, should there be an adjustment in that audit? How would an audit committee then evaluate that transaction? Uh, and Mr. Vasani, I will come to you now. Essentially, how does an audit committee actually look at transactions wherein the company has actually faced an adjustment from uh, while undergoing transfer pricing audit at the India level? I'm sorry, I missed your question in part. There was an audio break. In yes, the yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah, sorry. So, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat that. So, Ms. Vasani, here the question really is, when we talk about arms control principle, A, there is a, I'm looking at the timing. So, one is, at the time when I enter into a transaction, I have a prior approval that we all, we take, basis the regulations. We then have, you know, business that goes on. At the end of the year, you have the filing of the tax return by the corporate, and then this gets picked up in an audit, say, uh, a year down the line, or six months down the line. Because and at the time of filing of the return, we also have a, a specific hours from the transfer pricing rules that you also need to test that transaction. Should this transaction face an adjustment at a later stage, how would an audit committee actually view this? And how do they really, you know, what are the challenges that they will probably have when they need to approve this transaction on a going forward basis? Uh, good question, uh, Rajasri. Uh, I want to tell you, first of all, one view which very strongly SEBI believes, and I had an occasion to discuss this with SEBI. Yeah. See, the transfer pricing me methods prescribed under Section 92C of the Income Tax Act, those six methods, the CUP method and other methods which are prescribed. Uh, SEBI is not comfortable with the Board of Directors mechanically adopting it as a method for because the objectives of the two legislations are very different, as was pointed out by Priya. Right. And second thing, while there is a definition of arm strength under Section 188 of the Companies Act, that is as a, as if the counterparty is not a related party, uh, SEBI as well as MCA has chosen not to provide any navigational tools for the audit committee. And in practice, I don't know, I'm not a chartered accountant, but I don't think the audit committees are really looking at the issues if the subsequent stage in the audit, if the adjustment has been made in the transfer pricing, they would like to. They look at the transactions absolutely independently. Generally, most audit committees are ins insisting on an independent third party court. I have seen two, three practices. One, that audit committee applies its own judgment and they use independent third party court of comparable party to see whether the price is the right and not necessarily mechanically go by income tax methods. And number two, if income tax has done some adjustment at a later date, that doesn't mean necessarily that you uh, companies, because companies at this much prior in point of time, it's a prior approval. And once you approve the transaction, you reopen the issues, it may expose the audit committee to, 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 to the adequate scrutiny at that time. Uh, so I don't think uh, it's very uh, advisable to completely fall back upon income tax methods as the basis for approving the arms length pricing principle. I have come across instances of so clients where there are differences of opinion in the audit committee, they refer the matter to the entire board to seek a guidance, which is not prohibited under the scheme of the act. And in many cases, they have taken expert opinion, valuers of valuation opinion, uh, and not necessarily relied on it. And I don't think it's advisable to reopen the matter because the income tax officer has made some adjustment in the assessment. Sure. And I think this is also coupled with the fact that if the company itself, even should that, you know, should there be an adjustment that's made, clearly, uh, if the company hasn't accepted that, that also should be a good reason for not taking a relook at the transaction that's already taken place. You know, that's also another, you know, added defense I would probably think uh, can be adopted. 
uh, moving on to, you know, interesting um, in terms of arms and pr price and the adjustments and should that happen, then how does the audit committee really evaluate all of this? Why is it that there is a continuous need for uh, related party transactions? Do we really need to look at this on a continuous basis? And I think, Prasajit, I'll come over to you now and uh, you know, get your perspective in terms, as a company secretary, uh, you know, what do you think? Why is this? Uh, why is this? It's not just a one-time requirement, but it's a continuous evaluation. So your take on that. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sri, for the question. And uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. So SEBI has been making continuous effort, uh, effort in extending the RPTG governance framework because that is the reason in last couple of years we have seen so many amendments come in order to make sure that they understand and especially in the bigger interest of the public that every company should follow them. And that's where, you know, in, in spite of the ever also, the evolvement is happening every other day. And as I, I, I try to bring the same uh, particular word which mentioned by uh, Savitri Ma'am because it is a regular affair. Every time, you know, something comes up and a new question comes up around RPT. And that's that the beauty of this whole transaction because RPT is not itself anything, we are not doing anything wrong, okay? It's, it's a bringing efficiency in the whole, whole, you know, whole complete, you know, framework of RPTG. So there should be a continuous evaluation required, reason being RPG governance framework, which is consist of RPs or related parties identification, or you're talking about identification of related party transactions. So everything as, as, as a whole, you know, in order to create that robustness and to bring that robustness in the approval and disclosure system, you know, because it's RPD is all about how much you are disclosing okay and especially to those person who have questions who have questions around those it could be an audit committee it could be the minority shareholders or those unrelated uh, uh, shareholders who have questions on rpt in case our disclosures are right and how this disclosures mechanism could be stronger only mechanism is continuous thinking about it how we can make it better so in order to say, I just want to show one slide because that is important. Yeah, just, just allow a second. Is it visible to everyone? I cannot see yet. Yes. So, so, so if we just look at this, you know, whole RPT the governance life cycle, you know, it starts from identification of related parties going by and passing through the uh, journey of RPT transaction identification, continuous one, we're going through the policy and processes because law, law mandates us to review the policies in every three years. But whether that three years is a long period, to evaluate or we can go into six monthly or yearly evaluation of those policies and processes especially around the sops in order to make sure we identify we know the subsidy uh, especially the rpts where the company is not directly involved or maybe through the subsidy a particular rpt transaction is taking place how the documentation is you know taking place whether each and every documentation are in place to make sure that people who are or the particular authority who is approving that related party transactions are completely aware about a particular process, arm length, which nicely touched upon by Priya and uh, Elise. And after end of the day, the disclosures, the disclosures is, you know, is a sum. Whenever there is a doubt around RPT, I think disclosure is something that way uh, some, someone can create a complete transparency in the whole RPT system. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for that. So I will now uh, move to you, Savitri. Um, you know, what's your take on material modifications from a business perspective? Um, you know, it'll be interesting to get your sense. Savitri, you're on mute. Yeah. Thanks. So Rajshri, as you mentioned right at the outset, the approval uh, of the shareholders to a material uh, RPT is by means of majority of minority. So you need to get majority of the minority shareholders who vote. Now that's something, as you know, in India, the holding structure is very different. So that is something which one um, needs to be 
fully prepared for depending on the shareholding structure of the company and um, uh, that that that's something which you know one needs to clearly factor in when you have related party transactions um second is if you look at the definition of related party transactions uh, which which has come into effect from 1st of april 2022 it not only covers transactions of the company but also of the subsidiaries now the subsidiaries may be wholly owned subsidiaries or they may be other subsidiaries which are not wholly owned let's take a situation where a subsidiary is entering into a transaction with a related party of one of the other subsidiaries a fellow subsidiary as we normally call it uh, of of the company of the listed entity in such an event uh, what are the challenges let me repeat what i was just saying a subsidiary of the listed entity is entering into a transaction with a related party of another fellow subsidiary so from the listed entity's perspective it's actually one removed however if the transaction exceeds the thresholds of 1000 crore or 10% of the consolidated turnover of the listed entity then approval of the listed entity uh, listed entity's shareholders will be required which has to be a prior approval so having a clear identification of such related parties marking any such potential transactions on the database you know uh, prashanjit's uh, uh, slide was very useful there where he referred to identification that's the first step but identification of all the related parties and probable transactions if there is one transaction of a subsidiary with a related party of completely another subsidiary you need to be able to intervene at the right time and place it for prior approval of the shareholders of the listed entity before you give effect to it let me also give another simple example uh, under icdr in india you need to uh, make an uh, under sast sorry you need to make an open offer where the price is determined as per icdr let's assume a company uh, is acquiring more than 25% in another listed entity you would definitely go through the process and uh, you know you would also be making an open offer and your holding may go up accordingly definitely it will be more than 25% in which case the other listed entity automatically becomes an associate which is a related party and if there are transactions with such an entity you then need to have prior approval before you enter into the transactions so uh, and and just in case your acquisition exceeds 50% the other newly acquired entity becomes a subsidiary in which case you need to be ready with the related parties of that particular entity and you need to have your approvals in place before you have transactions with them if they are old transactions which have got concluded no problem otherwise you will need to have the approval so from a going concern perspective where you actually keep having transactions this becomes uh, something which one needs to be mindful of uh, i can go on and on rajeshree but i think these two examples would be sufficient to drive home the yeah, point yeah 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 absolutely thank you so much and in fact uh, you know the last point especially on the acquisition leads me to uh, uh, priya i'll come to you now which uh, you know the question on what constitutes comprehensive documentation especially for rpts and how does the documentation process differ for routine transactions compared to unique or one time related party transactions especially in the context of what savitri just articulated you know should a listed yeah. company look at acquiring i mean i will cross border will be another challenge but i'm saying even another entity and if you know you have to go through the open offer process what is the what do you mean by comprehensive documentation a little bit you know your perspective on that would be useful sure thanks for that um so when we talk about comprehensive documentation i think two guiding factors are extremely important firstly that it has to be contemporaneous as in on a real time basis and updated with as much as factual data uh, recent factual data as possible and secondly it, it should be transparent you know um when we talk about routine transaction i think typically we end up disclosing you know who are the related parties what the transaction is um what is the underlying terms and conditions um 
whether it's an ordinary course or not, and eventually conclude with the market analysis, which we call as benchmarking, right? Now, when we come to unique transaction, of course, all of this will come into play, but a major challenge that comes there is that you typically don't find exact market comparables there. Then how do you go about it? You break that down. As I said in, you know, when I was, um, you know, answering to your earlier question that um, documentation is not just about saying that this transaction is at arm's length price or my margin falls within this range. It's more about understanding and breaking down the transaction, including the cost components. And I'm just giving example there, the value drivers, whether any quotations were taken from third parties, um, what practically happens in this scenario uh, had it been, you know, an independent arrangement. And there could be many levers to kind of infer that. Those could be, you know, industry reports or, um, you know, inviting quotations. And there again, the timing is very critical because all these transactions go out for prior approval. So the timing of the analysis becomes extremely important. In our experience where we had, you know, kind of... Uh, um, validated arm's length of a unique transaction, we even used more than one way of giving our recommendation. We just didn't restrict to testing the profit or the margin. We also recommended the best practice, the kind of um, you know cost component that should be uh, taken into consideration. What is the expertise? What are the process costs? Why this transaction is important to be undertaken only with the related party and why not with any other third party. So when we talk about comprehensive documentation, I think a lot of um, rationale goes into play and a lot of that comes from the management of the company who are the clear guidance and who give us the first hand information. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for that, thank you, Phil. You know, in this era of wherein we are looking at, at the end of the day, you know, businesses want to grow, right? They want to grow, they want to deliver value to their stakeholders. And stakeholders is a far greater universe than just pure shareholders alone, because it, it covers the entire business fraternity and the economy in general. So, uh, you know, Liz, uh, this question is to you. How does a business really strike a ba fine balance between the governance standards, the disclosure requirement, and achieving stakeholder value? I think your question rightly identifies that there is a fine balance of managing conflicting requirements in this situation. So to create shareholder value, a business is going to need to interact with its uh, related parties, I don't know, to exploit cross-border opportunities, to undertake processes in a more efficient way, to use the most suitably qualified people wherever they're located and whatever their role is. And so, you know, there is a need for related party transactions. And I want to say that there's nothing wrong with them either. I think it's quite important for us to understand that they have a real role in creating growth for businesses. Um, but key stakeholders need to know about them and have confidence that they're not disadvantaged unfairly as a result of those related party transactions. Um, but if we think about how a business operates, generally the pricing of those interactions between group companies or with individual related parties, if they're not subject to these disclosure requirements, they're generally commercially sensitive information. It's, it's secret, effectively. And that's because that, you know it gives you a competitive edge. And, and if you disclose things to your competitors, um, that competitive edge, that, that's more knowledge, isn't it, in the public domain? So I think a business often needs timeliness and agility in making commercial decisions. And they need to have that timeliness and agility in, in pricing and resourcing. And you know, when there is an additional layer of disclosure, that can slow things down. And I think really experienced businesses will get that balance right. And they will do that through really excellent internal and external communication. And um, for me personally, and this is just my own personal view, I think that disclosure and, and transparency is simply a price a business pays for being a listed entity. 
And um, if the market's going to operate in a, a transparent and open way, which benefits all businesses and the wider economy, as you mentioned, then I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation to, to disclose. But there is, as you rightly say, a, a very fine balance between those internal and external needs. Thanks for that. Again, I mean, uh, I, I think you touched upon a very important point out there, Liz, i.e. are we disclosing too much? You know, in the uh, with an objective of being transparent and essentially, you know, disclosing uh, details, am I giving too much? And, you know, is, is, is my competitor, obviously, you know, competition is there in every business. And the question really is, we will disclose, no problem, but to what extent? And and I think that's the challenge which I'm sure businesses go through day in and day out. And on this point, I just would like to kind of just touch upon another aspect. Uh, and Mr. Vasani, this question is uh, to you. When we talk about governance, we talk about sustainability, we talk about social, and how do we how do we really balance this out in an era you know where opportunities, growth, and economic development are important. So today we are saying we want to achieve a sort of GDP and we want to be out there because clearly we are in a state wherein we do have that advantage. Question is, if that is our stated objective, how do I really balance all of this out with governance, social and sustainable? First of all, I think to proceed on an assumption that ESG is uh, going to destroy or limit the growth or governance is itself is a problem. According to me, ESG is a benchmark. <coughs> so sorry. Nobody can now ignore ESG as a factor. And in my opinion, it doesn't in any manner limit growth, limit expansion, limit and your point on disclosure. I think sunlight is the best disinfectant. 75% of India Inc. is promoter owned. Why should we be afraid of disclosing the transactions in public domain if uh, and, you know that is uh, and that's the trust factor, but which SEBI has a very serious trust factor deficit. That's why they came out with that 22nd November circular that we would not trust anyone and we would prescribe what should be disclosed to the audit committee, to the shareholders, and to the uh, board of directors. They, have not, they are not giving it to the discretion of the company. And ESG factors, in my opinion, does not in any manner limit. In fact, companies have been successfully world over adhering to ESG norms and at the same time achieving very high rate of growth. Uh, look at the empirical evidence. Let's not go on theory. Empirical evidence suggests, in fact, some of the fastest growing companies are very good on ESG factors. So, thanks. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, just on that a related point, uh, if sh would it be right to say that today related party transactions are a necessary, I wouldn't really say evil, but it's necessary Reason is because without a related party, without influence, without some kind of a control, it's a little difficult to achieve the results that one has set out for. That's a question I ask uh, myself. And maybe if uh, Mr. Vasani or Savitri, if you can share from an industry or a legal perspective, that would be very useful. Yeah, yeah, quickly give you, there's a very interesting OECD report, which is prepared in collaboration with SEBI. 52% of the related party transactions are in the larger national interest. Forget about interest of a particular company. They create a lot of synergy. For example, I'll just give you an example of the group where I was working, Tata Group. You know, entire steel purchased by Tata Motors for manufacture of its car is supplied by Tata Steel. They are related parties. And in fact, the transactions are negotiated on a very strong arm's length basis with a very heavy negotiations, completely at the market price. What is the what is the downside? Uh, so I don't think related parties RPT is a bad word. In fact, that's sure. a misnomer completely. In fact, our related party and you should study this OECD report, which is prepared in collaboration with SEBI. Uh, I don't think related party transactions are bad. They are bad only if they are disproportionately benefiting a one promoter entity. Other ninety percent of the related party transactions promote economies of scale, synergy, and many other benefits, including benefits of collective bargaining. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for that. Rightly said so, Ms. Vatani. And, you know, while we look at related party transactions, look at the processes, look at some of the compliances uh, that, you know, companies have to uh, kind of undertake. And this is, of course, listed companies very uh, to a large extent, but also their group companies or associate companies, because it extends to the entire value chain. It just doesn't stop at one, uh, you know, at one company level. 
I would now go to Prasenjit. Prasenjit, are we really looking at increasing the cost of compliance? Do we really see this as adding to your cost? Or is there a better way of managing this? Say, by example, you know, for example, using technology. And is that in some way kind of giving you better control and better governance? So take on that. Yeah. First of all, uh, I, I would say it's an investment rather than cost. Because it's again, it's, it's a continuous evolvement, right? Around the compliances, we are we are learning every day in order to understand the completely and international. As Mr. Basani rightly mentioned, more than fifty percent is of national interest. So, in it, if we just go by that, you know, uh, definitely the compliances uh, uh, got increased. Compliances got increased considering the uh, because earlier the definition of RPs or definition of RPDs now got enlarged. And due to that, coverage is much higher. And due to that, uh, you know, the, the strength of the uh, resources required in order to uh, carry on those compliances is definitely, uh, in terms of, if you talk about typical cost, it's, it, it is there. At the same time, you know, there's a lot of opportunities around this, as you rightly mentioned on the technology side. If, if we just create a mechanism, if we create a mechanism and everything is in place, right SOPs, and that SOPs in case we can inbuild in the technology also, you know, in case, in order to create more efficiency in the whole whole uh, RPT framework, I think we can we can somewhat to an extent we can reduce the additional cost if if we just you know think in terms of additional compliances right now. But yeah, in the interest of uh, compliances, I would say you know uh, that evolving uh, uh, circumstances around this RPT compliances. Uh, we, we should focus more on uh, something which is more on the on the technology side as well as ex expert experts in, in inclusion and as well as a, a, a good team which can understand the requirement better in terms of disclosure and transparency yeah thanks thanks for that so net net uh i guess what i will do is my final roundup of questions just to get your last minute uh you know what i would say is your take on the current regulations and uh balancing that with Ease of doing business. Savitri, your take on that? So, um, ease of doing business is, of course, integral to doing business and it has to be respected, it has to be provided for. Uh, however, with respect to compliances, one needs to be alert, ensure that there are control mechanisms, checks and balances where you are able to do uh, mid course correction, create awareness. This has become very, very important now because the person who's entering into a transaction may not necessarily be from the purchase or procurement team, maybe from any other team also, because the uh, transactions, uh, you know, the span of transactions has actually gone up manifold. So if I were to put it in one simple sentence, be alert, ensure you intervene at the right time. Thanks, Thanks for that. Rightly said. Liz, your take on that? I don't think the complexity is going to get any less. I think there is going to be an increasing need to think about how we communicate with our key stakeholders and recognising that those key stakeholders are going to be a wide range of groups. They will be related parties, they will be external uh, minority shareholders, there'll be tax authorities. I don't see the tension between these things going away. I love the description of ease of doing business is, is basically doing business. I think you're absolutely right there. Um, for, for, for me, this is about um, businesses recognising, coming back to your ESG point, businesses recognising they have parts to play in the business ecosystem. What is that part they want to pay? Some of it is about paying tax. Some of it is about uh, disclosing and being transparent. And I, I think we, we are setting frameworks uh, across the world um, to be able to enable those things to happen better and hopefully easier. On this. Mr. Vasani, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the question is that uh, this is a new normal. I think one has to accept it. And 
if you look at every amendment made by sebi in this rpt regulation scene which has come into force from 1st april 2020 to 2023 there is one corporate scandal behind it i can attribute a corporate scandal to a particular amendment regulators are going to use the lowest common denominator and going to make the changes i think one has to learn to live with this new reality 38 related party transaction resolutions have got defeated because of proxy advisories advising voting against the resolution I think Indian promoters have to learn to accept that now the new world order requires much greater transparency. The good old days of brushing it under the carpet and doing it in a hush-hush manner is no longer there. The world is digitized. The world is completely under microscope. There are proxy advisory firms. There is a 24 by 7 media business channels. There are very powerful social media presence where Anything which is malignant, which is not in the larger interest of all the stakeholders is going to be caught, you know, immediately registered and you will have a bad a reputation which is built over centuries can get tarnished because of one bad related party transaction. So I think all the compliance officers, board of directors, audit committee has to learn to live with this new normal. I don't find any problem with the new regulation because I think we have brought upon ourselves. If you look at it, each of these amendments, there's a corporate scandal behind it. And offline, I can discuss with you how these changes have come about. So, this, I think, uh, yes, compliance cost has gone up, but we invited upon ourselves this problem. Sure. Thanks for that candid response, Paradai. As usual, really great. Thanks. Uh, Priya, do I mean, I'll agree with Mr. Vasani that this is a new normal. And a lot uh, has been taken from what is happening around. But I think when you have, uh, you know, the right kind of awareness and the culture at the top, I think this becomes very organic in terms of making right disclosures and, you know, kind of uh, being fair and uh, transparent with your stakeholders. So once you have that right culture, I think ease of doing uh, business will also come uh, very easily and organically. Thanks. Thanks for that. Really, yeah. Agree. Prasenjit? Yes. So I, I, I think just I'd add uh, whatever they have mentioned. And uh, in, in the new norms, you know, uh, even if you consider a ease of doing business, definitely people are considering it. Because the last uh, financial year, to more than 235 uh, IPOs have come. So, so they are bringing, they're coming into this list of new RPT norms. So in some way, we, we have to just understand uh, that a few, few pillars we have to build on in terms of that RPT governance in order to continue this, probably a value, people, and to an extent, a great framework. Processes should be strong. And more of that, technology. I think that is something, uh, the new norm, where we should add technology to make a better, you know, transparent system. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, I will quickly move on to the QA. I think there are a few questions out here. So some of them probably have uh, been answered. Uh, we will look at some of the questions that are open. Uh, um, so I will. Okay. Uh, yeah. So there's one question around. Uh, which says ordinary course of business isn't real, isn't necessarily equivalent to the arms length standard. Commodity exchange prices can be considered as ordinary course of business, which might not be arms length or a third party transaction. Price actually happening. Any comments? Uh, who'd like to take this? Priya, would you take this? So I'm just trying to look at that question. Can, can or, you read that again? Uh, sure. Yeah, sure. It says ordinary course of business isn't necessarily equivalent to arm's length standard. Commodity exchange prices can be considered as ordinary course of business, which might not be arm's length or a third party transaction. Price actually happening. Any comments? Yeah, that, I mean, I agree with that. But many times there is a restriction of the comparable data and you eventually have to rely on a commodity exchange price to determine the arm's length price. Um, if there is enough comparable data around, then one can take a stand that probably the timings of the transaction doesn't match or the quantity or the volume of the exchange that happens on these commodity exchanges may not be comparable. But when you have limited comparable data, you might want to draw a reference to such a benchmark. Uh, Liz, I think you also had something to add there. I, I was just going to add the sentence that 
the arm's length price is usually a range of arm's length prices. And so right. um, th there is usually one price that sits there. So I absolutely could understand why these things do not necessarily cross over because we're talking about ranges here. Fine, Thank thanks for that. Liz. Um, I'll probably take, in the interest of time, maybe some of the other questions we will respond, uh, but otherwise right now, Mr. Vasani, just your, uh, your guidance on this one. For high value debt listed companies, where equity shares are not listed. So this is companies where you know the debt is listed and all shareholders are related parties. How will RPTs be approved under the LODR? I think I would give it to Savitri to answer that she is dealing with those issues. So Savitri okay. So in case of high value debt listed entities, in any case, we are presently in the comply or explain regime. And if you do not have any um, any any shareholders who are not related parties, then you would not be able to get it approved at the general meeting. Because unlike under Companies Act, where there's an exemption which has been granted in case of private companies where, or in case of closely held public companies where more than 90% are related parties, here in case of a high value debt listed entity, there is no corresponding exemption. However, the lawmakers have actually thought it fit to put it under a comply or explain regime. So one can always uh, explain this transaction. Sure. That, uh, thank you for that. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I will take probably one last question and then maybe look at... Okay, here there is... Thresholds are 10% or 1,000 crores, whichever is less. This has led to increase in compliance requirements for large corporates with transactions as low as 2% of turnover needing minority shareholder approval. How fair is this requirement? I guess uh, if with the permission of the panel, if I can respond to this, that is what it is. You will need the approval. So there is, in business, there's nothing which is fair uh, or probably, let me put it the other way around. Everything is fair when it comes to business. So from a regulator standpoint, all they're saying is disclose, seek the necessary approvals, and make sure that all the information is available to the larger uh, stakeholder group and not just to a selected few. Uh, with that, uh, I think uh, we come to an end of the session. There are a few questions. We will respond to that uh, eventually. Most of them have been answered. There are two of one or two which we will respond to, but I would Really thank each and every member on this panel. Salsri, thank you very much. Bharat Bhai, really appreciate. Thank you very much. Liz, thank you very much for your time. I know it's a different time zone, but really appreciate your time and inputs. Priya Prasanji, thank you very much. And a huge thank you to all my members who are Abarna, Gaurav. I think the whole team has kind of, uh, you know, been responding to questions at lightning speed. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.